Hello and welcome to the special show at a time when the Indian economy is facing multiple challenges. We are in conversation with the Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission, Dr. Montek Singh Aluwalia, a key policy maker in the Indian policy making firmament. Dr. Aluwalia, thanks very much for speaking with us on Bloomberg Television India. If I can begin by asking you, uh, there seems to be, if I, if I hear commentary correctly, especially from foreign investors who have spoken on our platform and other platforms, that fair enough, uh, there has been some progress on the reforms front on the policy front, let's say from last September, but more needs to be done. Perhaps, uh, you know, that uh, now it's a lot of talk, but uh, the concrete action is almost missing on the ground. Well, I, I would say that concrete results from action taken is not yet fully evident. Uh, I think the talk is basically, a, first of all, a recognition that the economy is in a difficult position. I mean, that's important because people don't take corrective steps if they don't think there's a problem. Uh, I think we've taken a number of corrective steps and we've talked about it. <clears throat> some of those corrective steps actually require some end result to emerge. For example, one of the most important initiatives of the government to get projects moving was to set up the Cabinet Committee on Investment, which was meant to take a holistic view of uh, projects that are stuck and then move them forward in a sensible manner. Now, the Cabinet Committee has met. Uh, some progress has been made. Some things which, have, which were holding up projects have been cleared. But I know that quite a lot is actually still in the pipeline. And I'm quite hopeful that, you know, within a framework of maybe two or three weeks, uh, we will see a lot more action indicating that these problems are beginning to be resolved. And I think when you see that, uh, there will be enough evidence that things are, things are being done which are leading to end results. And of course, we have to do a lot more. This is going to be a difficult year. Sure. So I don't think there's a silver bullet type of situation. Mm -hmm. But I think what people need immediately is that, look, there's at least as much talk as there, uh, as much action as there has been talk. There is action but it hasn't surfaced yet in terms of problem resolution. But you don't think that uh, the government has over-promised and under-delivered so far? Well, you know, delivery always takes time. <clears throat> so I think it's promised what it needed to promise. It now has to deliver that. I'm not disappointed that all of that delivery hasn't happened. Because these are complex issues where, you know, either you have regulatory hold-ups and you don't want to sort of simply arbitrarily uh, make decisions. You want to make a, a sensible, balanced decision, taking account of all the different concerns. That's bound to take a little bit of time. Having said that, uh, you know, on three key issues, for example, on the uncertainty of tax policies, now I know it's not within your remit, it's really a financial or finance ministry mm -hmm. issue, but you know, after the GAR Vodafone scare, now we've got the transfer pricing scare again, and that is spooking foreign investors. We don't still have clarity on a lot of FDI issues, for example. There is a concern of foreign investors on government expenditure, on subsidy cutbacks. Now, unless you give clarity to a foreign investor, or even to a domestic investor, surely the investment sentiment, the climate will not improve. No, let me, let's, let's partition those uh, points. You know, as far as taxes are concerned, now you've focused on <clears throat> the issue of transfer pricing. Sort of the rules that affect what are called contract research organizations. I know a couple of circulars have been issued and there have been many people who said that they're not very clear and where they're clear they may be not be pointing in the right direction. I'm sure the finance ministry is looking at those issues. I have no idea whether there is a process of consultation going on. But you know the finance minister had said that it's at the time that he replies to the finance bill, which will be sometime in May, that all these issues will be fully clarified. It's not unusual. <clears throat> that a circular gets issued, it's interpreted in a manner which perhaps is not the intention. They can clarify that subsequently. But, and they should, in my view. It is true in that particular case that I've, I've heard from a lot of people that it wasn't what they expected. Now, you know, we've had the Rangachari uh, committee report. Uh, I haven't actually seen the report. It's not yet been made public. Uh, but I'm sure that the Rangachari committee went into all these issues at great length and I'm sure the finance ministry is looking at whatever is going on on the ground and the recommendations of the Rangachari committee and will try to reconcile the two. 
Now, you spoke about the CCI, uh, and you yourself said that, yes, a lot perhaps needs to be done. Perhaps the pace of decision-making needs to be expedited. Would you at least admit that? And how do you solve fundamental issues like coal linkages, for example? There are some well, issues. Yeah, there. let me say, you know, when you say the pace of decision-making needs to be expedited, when, when you have multiple stakeholders, uh, some amount of consultation to hear different points of view, in order to decide what would be the best balance. This is both essential, it's unavoidable. And I would say that uh, that is why you haven't yet had a decision on three or four of these things. But you know, if that merely means that it's going to happen two or three weeks later, I wouldn't call that too bad. So the key, the key issue is, will we have resolved these problems in two to three weeks? I'm very hopeful that we would. Now you take coal. I mean, the fundamental point is that A, We've had a huge ramp up in generation capacity. Mm -hmm. To support that kind of a ramp up in generation capacity, we needed a big step up in coal production. Over a longer term, we may be able to get it. In the short run, that's not likely. Therefore, in the next couple of years, it's a no-brainer that we've got this capacity that's been set up. We just have to import coal and use it. The problem that comes up is that imported coal is a lot more expensive than domestic coal. So this is a case where the domestic energy price has not been aligned with global prices and as a result people keep complaining that there's a huge shortage of domestic coal because it's cheaper. But the there's no also, shortage of coal. But, but so we have to resolve this in some manner. I'm sure, but let me interrupt here. The government also has not perhaps been proactive in bringing about a bill which allows private mining of coal. I mean, that is supposed yeah, to be a policy block. Let me say here. on that one, <coughs> that is a, it is a policy block. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in the plan, my view, and I think that's there in the plan, mm -hmm. is that we should reverse the nationalization of coal. That's my personal view. It makes no sense to keep coal nationalized when petroleum is not nationalized. I mean, you know, after all, Absolutely. the policy that you have for natural gas, the policy that you have for petroleum, cannot be all that different from the policy we have for coal. But is the government moving in the, on well, that direction? Well, my understanding is, you know, a bill was introduced a long time ago. There just doesn't seem to be the political support for it, at least not now. Let me say that even if we don't achieve denationalization, you know, 80% of coal is actually used for thermal power plants. So the policy does allow captive coal mines to service thermal power plants. So effectively, uh, private mining of coal in the form of captive mining is actually possible. It hasn't worked so well because there are all kinds of regulatory uh, clearances, environmental clearances that are holding up, and that's what we need to focus on. Whatever we do, in the next two years, uh, the, there's no question that we have to import coal. So I think we need a longer-term strategy which uh, expands the production of Coal India. Several steps are being taken to do that, including getting Coal India to go in for PPP-based exploration of its existing but mines. But as far as Coal India is concerned, Dr. Ali, well, there, there seems to be a serious difference of opinion over a large number of issues with, let's say, another state player, NTPC, for example, on the quality of coal, on the pricing of coal, it's going back and forth. Having said that, how does the government step in? I know that there is a GM and a coal regulator, perhaps, which is going to meet very soon. Is that one solution? I think, by the way, these, uh, you're right, it's all over the newspapers. Uh, these are what I would call <coughs> intercorporate differences that would exist even if they were completely private sector companies. The difference, I think, is that in a completely private sector world, the contractual relationship would be very precisely defined and there wouldn't be ambiguity. When you're moving from a dominantly public sector to public sector world, uh, these relationships, uh, tests of quality, etc., tend to be left vague. We have to make that switch. But are you, are I don't you, think that's going to happen in two months' time. Sure. What has to happen in two months' time is that we cannot have so many thousand megawatts of capacity without fuel. And I think we are working on a way of bringing in imported coal, getting these plants to operate, there are two or three things you have to do. First is that, you know, you can't leave some plants 100% dependent on imported coal because the boilers won't take it. Sure. So there's a certain limit up to which people can use coal 
which is imported. So you've got to ration out uh, across plants how much import can they use and how much not. If imported coal is higher cost, and it is higher cost, you've got to make sure that that's passed on in the tariff. But is the, is the government through. actually changing policy? I know that there is discussion about changing the standard bidding documents. Are you, are you encouraged by the recent uh, CERC ruling, which allowed for compensatory tariff for, for a similar case in Adani, for example, where it was based on imported coal? And, yeah. uh, no, <coughs> is, is I'm aware way, of that case. Is, isn't the policy direction that the government would take now? As a general rule, I personally feel that power producers should not be expected to bear fuel risks. I mean, variations in the price of fuel should not be a cost center for somebody whose job is to produce electricity with a maximum efficiency. In this particular case, the problem is they entered into a contract in which they took the fuel risk, but then all kinds of things happen globally. I think the CERC, by saying this is a legitimate, a legitimate case where you could pass on the cost, has done the sensible thing. It is, it is a problem because it's an ex post modification. Uh, and I think if you took a puristic view, uh, you could argue that, well, you know, they took the risk and leave it to them. I think the CERC, the principle on which they've operated is definitely that fuel producers should not take the fuel risk uh, or should not be expected to take the fuel risk. The trouble is in this case, the company did take the fuel risk. So, you could raise, people could raise issues, but I, I have no problem with it.